Hello, and welcome to the Leipzig class. As good a reason as anyone has ever come up with for eating a lot of chocolate. Because this is the opportunity. This class is... Let's talk about it. These have nine six-inch guns. Mm-hmm. That sounds like that sounds right in. Oh, that sounded like a decent size for the light cruiser. Yeah, okay, it's not going to be a big town class with 12 or some of the other American doodahs, and definitely not um, one of the uh, Japanese big ones, but it's decent in the light cruiser territory. And uh, yeah, they're going to be in triple turrets. Oh, 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 that, uh, oh, that sounds good. That sounds good, right? And there's so many options what we can do here you know it can it can really be good and they improve versions of the Königsberg class okay how have they improved them have they completely restylized them because that would be an improvement that would be a big improvement uh because you know the, 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 you know there were all such and i go yes they have they've recited the guns oh oh this is this is this is giving me so much hope. Oh, these are going to be good. These, I know they're going to be good. I know they're going to be good. I know they're going to be good. I know they... Oh, God, no. No, they did it again to me, didn't they? Yeah. In another example of... One forward, two aft, turret design. This time we're not going to cant one off to one side and the other off the other side. We are going to be sort of centre line with them, which should be good for stability reasons, but we are still going with twice as many guns firing aft as forward. Okay. All right. Okay, the odds of... Are you engaging ships directly in front of you? Yeah, you can angle it. So, yeah, you can bring your full weight of fire. But no! You have been telling me this is a light cruiser, not a mine layer. It's not supposed to be rapidly retreating anywhere. It's supposed to be a light cruiser, which means it's supposed to be able to escort your major service combatants, which means... If it's escorting a major service command, it's probably engaging in a fight. In which case, if it's engaging in a fight, it's probably going towards that fight. Unless you're planning on winning all your wars by running away, which doesn't tend to work. Yes, you can meet the Russians, you can run away to the point at which winter decimates your opponents. But that only works as long as you have the logistical supplies and you can fight forward afterwards to recapture the territory. And it doesn't work like that at sea. Because eventually you do run out of places you can go. You do have to come out of port occasionally. You do have to do things. Before people go, but, you know, it, 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 it's forcing them by design choices. No, it's not. No, it is not. There is no good reason from a naval perspective, an operational perspective to put all your guns stern. Especially as your stern tends to be the area which you can have the most freedom of moving things around. Especially if you want something to be mine layer as well. Again, makes sense. In fact, what would have been a really sensible thing for them to do if they really want a mine layer? Is to put all the triple turrets forward okay go with all turrets forward and then have the mines go aft and then have your aa defenses around your superstructure in this and you know secondaries aa defenses around your superstructure and files in the middle and that being a really efficient design because it would mean your guns were there your torpedoes secondaries there and your mind's there. Nice differentiation through the hull. Very easy to organize things. Very engineeringly efficient. This is not engineeringly efficient. This is a mess. 
There's a mess in the Koenigsberg class. There's a mess in the Leipzig class. And the big problem is they were planning on fixing it when they got to the M class, which were probably going to be the German equivalent of the towns in some ways, or probably actually mostly the Leanders. Because they're going to have eight six-inch guns. And it, the, the people do say they're influenced by the M's are influenced by the town class. But if they were influenced by the town class, I would like to point out something. You already have a treble six-inch gun in such... I know it's 5.9, but bear me out. It's equivalent, roughly equivalent to a six-inch gun. Here, here's the thing. Here's how you might fix it, okay? Uh... You take your design for the Leipzig class. You extend it and proportionate the whole uh, hull appropriately. And uh, you add in another treble turret and you arm forward. And then you have a very, very good balanced ship. And again, if it's a going to be a gun fighting light cruiser, a balanced perspective makes sense. If you're supposed to be a mine slayer, Okay, then there are things that make sense on how to do it. But again, you could go with that all forward gun layout. Um, I, I No, I don't particularly like it because, as I've said before, in the nice way, if you're talking about a cruiser and you're going for all forward layouts, that's usually because you've got something stupid happening at the rear end. I, you're trying to turn, turn it into an aircraft carrier, which doesn't really work. Because uh, you're not going to be able to carry enough aircraft, you're not going to be able to land them. You're basically it's a float plane carrier, which is going to be just a target, and have a lot of aviation fuel in the rear. Or it's going to be a mine layer, but and honestly, there are some good examples of them, very good mine layers around, which definitely do not have all forward layers of guns. But if you are trying to say we have limited engineering capabilities, we have limited proficiencies, we are trying to do the most efficient we can use of our capabilities, in, from an engineering perspective, all forward guns, aft mines, center, your torpedoes and secondaries, makes sense. It really does. And they don't do it. They don't. They do this. Do this. Vitals. Well, Leipzig is 8,100 tons in full load. Nuremberg is 9,000 tons in full load. So, please, can we stop? You know, here's the thing. I have real issues with these ships being called a class. They're kind of like HMS York and HMS Exeter, which came, at, um, today as I'm recording this, actually were uh, put out yesterday, the cut price, uh, cut price counties, as I call them, rather than a full fat county. They are so different. They are so completely different that if, they might as well actually be called, if you, if you really want to call them a class, link them in with Koenigsberg and claim they're all a class of four and that these two are the evolutions of the subclass of the Koenigsberg. Because that would make more sense and would certainly seem to have more relation of reality than trying to claim they are the same class. Because even the Koenigsbergs, yes, they are. 7,700, well, 7,800 tons in full load. So, they are closer, a Koenigsberg is closer to Leipzig in full load than Nuremberg is to Leipzig. Let me restate it again. Leipzig is closer, it's only 300 tons 400 tons. I mean, it's 300. Well, 300, yeah. 300. Yeah, 300 tons. Long tons or normal tons? More than a Königsberg. Nuremberg is 940 tons more. 940 tons more than Leipzig is. A 
if that was a battleship, it'd be called in the margin of error. But in the nicest way, it's, this is no battleship. This is a light cruiser. A heavy light cruiser, but a light cruiser. And again, their length is different. Leipzig, 177 meters overall. Nuremberg, 181.3 meters. Four meters longer. Beam, that's, that's the same. But draft, Leipzig, 5.69 meters. Nuremberg. 5.74 meters. And again, I, I, I could bring up the Königsberg class, which had a draft of uh, 6.28 meters. Okay. And a length of 174 meters. Now, why am I bringing them up? Because again, 174 meters, they're only three meters shorter than Leipzig. Whereas Nuremberg is 4.3 meters longer than Leipzig. Again, they are not the same class. They are trans. Okay, you could call it all. This is the. This is what Germany is building. This is their production of light cruisers. And could just call them the one, the Koenigsberg class, with batch one being the Koenigsbergs as we understand them. I mean, Koenigsberg and Karusch. Uh, batch two being Leipzig. Batch three being Nuremberg. That would make sense. It is iterations on the same design policy, the same twaddle of a design philosophy, the same mistakes of a design philosophy, the same problems of a design philosophy. But they are not. A class. Once again, we have geared steam turbines and diesel engines, as in the Koenigsbergs. From six water tube boilers supplying two steam turbines to generate 60,000 PS. Well, that's uh, 59,000 shaft horsepower. Four diesel engines supplying uh, 12,400 PS, so that's 12,200 shaft horsepower. These collectively drove three screw propellers for a top speed of 32 knots, a range of 3,900 nautical miles at 10 knots. Koenigsberg class, top speed 32 knots, range 5,700 nautical miles at 19 knots. Actually, I'm starting to think maybe the Koenigsbergs didn't want to be classed in with them because they were so much better. Oh. Leipzig, 26 officers, 580 listed men. Nurmberg, 25 officers. They somehow drop an officer. But they don't worry. But you, before you feel bad, about, about, uh, bad for Nurmberg, she picks up 140 enlisted men. We'll do the comparison in a second. Armament. Well, it gets modified a lot, as most things do in a world war, but this is roughly what they start off with. Uh, nine, five point, 150 millimeter, 5.9 inch guns. For Leipzig, same for Nürburgring. Uh, Leipzig starts off with two 88 millimeters. Nürburgring starts off with eight. Leipzig gains... 12 20-inch torpedo tubes and the ability to carry 120 mines. Nurmberg, well, she also gets some 37 millimeters, some 20 millimeters, 12 21-inch torpedo tubes, that's uh, 533 millimeter torpedo tubes, and 120 mines. I think just group together because we feel like it, because we want to claim their class. Belt. Theoretically similar, but actually slightly differently applied. 
and both carried aircraft to Arado and the 196s. But the belts roughly 50 millimeters by Alfama, deck 30 millimeters, conning tower 100 millimeters, uh, turrets 80 millimeters, and barbette 60 millimeters. So there you go. And the thing about the Leipzigs is they are built between 1928 and 1934, and they're in commission from 1931. So who is their contemporary? Well, hello, meet HMZS Achilles. Built by Camel Lads. I should point out the, coin, uh, the um, Leipzig class were built by builders I've already sort of covered. The Kriegsmarine Werft and the Wilhelmshaven and the Dutchwerk in Kiel. So, I've covered them before in previous videos. Uh, let's see. Leipzig's the spe uh, Leipzig is 8,001, well, 8,000 long tons in full load. And Nuremberg is 8,900 long tons in full load. Um, Achilles, 9,740 tons in full load. Yeah, so she's a little bit heavier. Eight six inch guns. Top speed, 32 and a quarter knots. Range, 5,730 nautical miles at 30 knots. Interesting question. Other weapon systems they do carry eight to 21 inch, that's 533 millimeter torpedo tubes. They did carry um, about eight 102 millimeter guns in, no, no, four single to start off with, and then later up to double um, 102 millimeter gun, uh, four inch guns, 102 millimeters. So, yeah. Magazines, three inch of seventy six millimeter box armor, uh, one inch deck, and uh, garret and the gun turrets had an inch of armor as well. Four shafts driving, uh, being driven by four geared steam turbines, supplied by six Admiralty free drum boilers, roughly one hundred sixty nine meters long, so shorter. And a draft of 5.8 meters. So these are their rough equivalents. You get a pick. You can be in one or the other. In the Nuremberg and Leipzig, you theoretically have one more gun, which helps. And that's nice. But pick. Fully loaded, ready for war, which one would you prefer to be in? I know which one I'd choose. Because if I was captain of that, I have a lot of options. If, depending on angle, I can be out shooting. my opponent. And the thing is, again, that this is, I do think German cruisers suffer because of their lack of infrastructure to build them, but also in comparison because of their battleship program, because it means they don't get to build the M-Class. And of course, the RN after the M-Class go, hmm, well, we're going to build the refusers to try and test out them. After we've done the the end of class, and then we build the town class. M class never comes into existence. The German equivalent of what was supposed to be the light cruiser. This is my whole problem with people going, well, Plan Z and all these things. Nicest way for Plan Z to come into existence in the 1940s. It would need to be well underway. By 1939. Well, I'm not talking to ships in the construction. I'm talking 
whole shipyards would have to be under construction. It doesn't happen. So let's consider the Leipzig. Let's consider these ships individually. And gorgeous, lovely ONI does supply appropriate documents. So, Leipzig. What's her career like? What does she get up to? She has quite an interesting life. Um, she's laid down in Wilhelmshaven on the 20th of April 1928 and launched in October 1929. Uh, she commissions into the Reichsmarine on the 8th of October 1931. Uh, trains up in the, uh, in the Baltic Sea, where you can argue that possibly this system does have some, uh, some advantages. I don't think there are actually any advantages even in the Baltic Sea. Again, it's only advantage if you continue thinking you're going to be running away from everyone. Um, what are you there for? Are you going to run in, make a rapid torpedo strike, then run away while dropping off mines and using the guns to cover you? That doesn't really make sense. Eventually, she had her single 88mm guns replaced with twin mounts. Uh, the modifications are made in Kiel. And then in 1935, she took part in exercise with the pre dreadnought battleship Steisen, the brand new at that time Deutschland, and the light cruiser Kong. Adolf Hitler even visited the ship, and she joined her sister Nuremberg and the Kohl uh, for exercise in Atlantic Ocean in 1936. She took part in non-intervention patrols of Spain, and she was involved in a lot of the work around that, around the presence. At one point, she even does test out what was supposed to be a major exercise in the Atlantic. The whole point was, in the middle of 1939, she joined Neisenau, Deutschland, several destroyers and new boats, and they basically spent their time acting as a task force in the Atlantic. This is an interesting point because this is the point at which you can say the Germans were actually practicing what they're thinking about for war. And you have a task group being built up of a fast battleship, of a heavy cruiser, of a light cruiser, and destroyers, and U-boats. Think about that from the Royal Navy's perspective. That's a far scarier group than the Germans actually ever managed to produce in wartime. Yeah, we don't like it when their battleships come out to play. But a battleship, a heavy cruiser, a light cruiser, handful of destroyers. I, I do love the various reports about how, how many they were involved in that. But here's the point. Germany only had 22 destroyers by the time World War II began. It's the, the, the number involved in the exercise is debatable. And when I say debatable, I mean there are parts where there seems to be there are more ships part of the group than there actually turn up at the exercise in the Middle Atlantic. But, you know, handful is what we should be going with. When war broke out, Leipzig's job was to prevent the escape of the Polish Navy. Unsuccessful is putting it mildly. Now after she and the other light cruisers were laying minefields to try and defend against British intervention. In November 1939 she covered a mine laying operation off sea where she's joined by Deutschland, Köln and three torpedo boats. 
And later on that year, she's tasked with escorting Sean Horse and Nisenau through the Skaragak. And covering her return on 27th of November. So, she has a full time. She's escorting for visit destroyers through the Skyrak and all sorts of operations. But in December 1939, well, she meets her first enemy. And this is, before we get into this, this is where we should start considering that armor cross section. And this lovely graphic comes from Wikipedia, by the way. My drawing skills are not that good. If you want proof of that, have a look at the drawings I haven't managed to produce for the G3s, G3 conversion into aircraft carriers, which I was trying to do for the video which came out on Sunday when this comes out. Um, they're just terrible. They are absolutely atrocious to drawings. My hand drawings are awful. Um, I've tried it on the computer. The thumbnail is slightly better, but it's not that good. This is a fairly good and accurate drawing. Now, you can see the bulging, you can see the spacing in the hull, you can see where the armor is. Small problem for Leipzig. She's hit by a torpedo from her first of her enemies. HMS Salmon. HMS Salmon. Appropriately. And um, so, Salmon hits Leipzig with a single torpedo. This is on the 13th December 1931. Torpedo hit just below the waterline. Mm hmm. Have a look at that waterline, the blue line. Should be able to survive, but. It hit exactly where a bulkhead, a bulkhead separated two of the ship's three boiler rooms. Explosion bent her armoured deck and damaged her keel. Some, well, 1,700 plus tonnes of uh, water flooded the ship. Uh, the damage cut the electrical power supply to the ship's pumping system because it hadn't been in. It was perfectly positioned, you know. It was going to be survival. They didn't need redundancy. Yeah, didn't need redundancy. Life happens when you don't have redundancy. And, well, the two boiler rooms were flooded. Steam lines were damaged. The port turbine shut down. And... At the same time, Salmon also fires, uh, manages to torpedo Nuremberg. Slightly less damage is done to Nuremberg. Uh, luckily, a pair of destroyers were available. They turned up and escorted the damaged cruisers back to port. An hour after the Leipzig had been torpedoed, one of the escorting destroyers was also torpedoed. This is just outside the mouth of the Elbe, at Elba, and another torpedo just pa passed just the head of Leipzig, which nearly hit the damaged cruiser, and would have taken her out. And then en route back to Germany on the 14th of December, uh, they come under attack by the Royal Air Force with 20 Vickers Wellington bombers um, attacking. They actually end up getting a lot of the British bombers shot down by um, Gruppe, a second Gruppe um, of the Jagdzwager, the, the fighters. But, you know, they tried. They tried. But here is the point. Single torpedo doesn't sink. But very nearly got a second one. Royal Navy submarines, they had, they, even when they got their hits, they didn't get to the final knockout blow. And it wasn't because their torpedoes didn't work, it was just luck. We hit the escorting destroyer. Hang, we're after the cruiser. Ah, Nuremberg. Let's consider her. And if you notice, there are differences between the two. 
surprisingly, considering they are completely different, once you get below the surface level of, they are the same layout. Yeah. In the nicest way, though, a... What's the example I can give? Same layout, but different, completely different internals. Well, let's be honest. A Bentley... A, no, a Rolls-Royce. Four-door. Has the same layout as... <laughs> I'm not going to be that cruel, not going to be that cruel, not going to be that cruel. A Rolls-Royce has the same layout as a BMW. Seven, a BMW 4-door 7 Series. But they're very different cars. They're both high-end, but they're very different. It's the same with Nuremberg and Leipzig. Yeah, we're going to claim they're the same class, but they're really not. Also, from a country which produces Porsche. Porsche, it seems a bit strange that they are putting all the power at the front. Ay, oh, caramba. As you can see, though, there are differences. There are differences in the armour and the positioning, and O&I does a good job of illustrating some of these differences. Leipzig. Nuremberg. Leipzig. Ooh, look at those armour going up into various points in Leipzig. Looks like it's got more spaces covered by armour. But, hmm, different. I'm also not sure how on the density of battery fire the line of it has only three pointing aft and three pointing forward. I'm fairly sure it's six pointing aft, so I'm not quite sure about O and I here. See, this one seems slightly more accurate to me. Unless, of course, and I could be wrong about this, it could mean that one of the uh, one of the aft turrets on Nuremberg was always judged as not being able to work properly. But I would say the firing profile is more likely that provided on Leipzig here. Of nine of three for forward, then six between 18 and 35 degrees, nine from 35 degrees to 135 degrees, and then six between 135s. But no, a career for Leipzig doesn't get much better than getting torpedoed by HMS Salmon. And that is why I do have a video, a slide dedicated to the enemies of HMS uh, of Leipzig, including that includes HMS Salmon, because honestly, life just gets a little bit worse. Uh, she comes out of her refit and repair, and well, let's put it this way: she's reclassified technically as a training ship at this point. She loses. Four of her boilers. And this is to accommodate additional training crews. I just would like to see a Royal Navy Admiral's face if you told him we're going to take out the boilers on a ship to accommodate extra training crews. It's a perfectly technical and logical methodology of it. 
But I think it'd be more a case of you are going to do what? Is this because we've done so much damage that we should be writing this ship off? That sounds like a logical conclusion. After all, two boiler rooms have just been... <clears throat> but... The reality is... It's usually what you start sticking, uh, sticking up lightly framed superstructure which can be serving as classrooms and accommodation and for students. It's kind of like if you've ever seen the daring class uh, after they lose some of their torpedoes in Royal Navy service. And I'm talking about the 1950s daring class. We need to put in more power generators and things for radar, etc. and other systems. Okay, fine. Torpedoes go. Rooms get built up on top. Are we losing engine power? No. Why? Because engine power is good. It allows us to go fast and fight. But Leipzig really does have a terrible career in some respects, and that she's she whenever she seems to be doing well and actually getting up, she gets struck down by strange things. So she of course got torpedoed by salmon. And then while she's a training cruiser, well she takes part in escorting the Lutzau, which of course is formerly was Deutschland to Norway. Uh, then she and Emden provide artillery support uh, uh, during o Operation Barbarossa. Okay, you're sending a training cruiser to do artillery support on the front line. This sounds more and more like you're covering for the fact you can't replace the engines. You've done enough damage to the ship. In September of 1941, she was part of the invasion of the Baltic Islands in the West Estonian Archipelago. Again, she's attacked by another submarine, the Soviet SN, well, let's say 317, because honestly, I can't really pronounce that, not far from Moon Island. She managed to avoid getting hit this time. She does. And then she takes part in September, uh, later in that month, in an operation centered on Tirpitz where they tried to block a possible Soviet attempt to break out of the Baltic. Okay. This is... The Baltic is one of those areas which doesn't get enough study in World War II. But let's consider this. You are either saying that if you're going to need to fight, you need your really powerful ship. Hence, you're bringing... The Kerpitz Long, which is your biggest, newest, nastiest ba uh, battleship. But you're also bringing along the cruiser, which has lost engines to become training room facilities. Sorry for the long silence, but that doesn't compute. That doesn't compute. You, you just, you're asking for trouble. And surprise, surprise, trouble does happen. She's managing to do well. She then has an outbreak of meningitis. She's carrying on with her training duties. In fact, she was flagship of the training fleet in 1942. Lovely job, which is restricted in speed. Um, then in 1934, resumes her escort duties, takes on mining duties as well, manages to end up having collision with Prince Jürgen, so yeah, enemy number two of Leipzig, mm-hmm, Prince Jürgen. Um, Jürgen was steaming at 20 knots through heavy fog. Leipzig probably didn't make uh, make uh, 20 knots. Um, so Leipzig had to 
switch from using her diesel cruise engines to her steam turbine, which meant Leipzig for Leipzig to do that, you have to first uncouple the diesel engines from the shafts and then couple the turbine steam turbines to the shafts. This process temporarily leaves your ship without motive power. Which is why she drifted into the path of Prince Jürgen. Prince Jürgen hit just forward of Leipzig's funnel and cut her nearly in half. In fact, the clipper bow of Prince Jürgen was actually sticking out beyond the starboard side of Leipzig. So, Prince Jürgen almost came close to managing what HMS Salmon had tried firmly to do. Break Leipzig in half. Again, she yeah, has an engine room destroyed, fl uh, another one flooded, and loses roughly 40 crew. The ships were stuck together for over a day, and Leipzig was towed back to Gottfenhalm. Um Basically, all they did was do enough repairs to keep her afloat. She wasn't able to be put on to service in any capacity. So, she provided fire support against her next great enemy, the Soviet Red Army, as they advanced. She was moved to Hela, laden with refugees, but not really able to uh, steam at more than six knots herself. She's attempted to be torpedoed by Allied submarines and Soviet aircraft, and managed to reach Denmark in April. Forty-five. After which point, she basically just left there. Eventually, she's captured by the Allies. Eventually, she's used uh, by the mine sweeping administration, which were clearing mines off the German coast. Uh, but eventually, she's towed out and scuttled in July nineteen forty-six because her enemies have finally won. Leipzig is no more. Okay. Let's go to Nuremberg. Oh, I wish I could say I was about to have a happier time talking about it, but honestly, the only more benighted group than the German Navy's light cruiser program where the German Navy inflicted this on themselves, let's be honest. There are honestly legitimate reasons people come up with which are going, oh, well, they're using this as an experimentation tool, as a training tool, as something to keep all these skills alive. I can accept all of that as a good idea. There are better ways of doing it, though. You do not need to make ships like this. You do not need to do this to ships and crews. You do not. There are many different ways, and the ideas were going around at the time. There's not just all forward air, all forward capital ships, there are the Japanese doing all forward cruisers. There are lots of people working out different ideas of how to develop these systems. It can actually mean quite a good idea, if you can imagine, if you've got your aircraft and mines on the stern, on the stern guns forward, and in the middle you've got your, propul your propulsion turbines and everything else. That could work. That's not going to produce too bad a ship. Originally, um, she was supposed to carry the Hankel HE-60 float planes, but she got the Arado one IR-1962.
After World War II began, she was actually fitted with a degaussing coil to protect her against magnetic mines. And in 1942, her aircraft equipment and aft torpedo tubes were removed. She often had some of the most advanced radars fitted to any German ship. For periods, she did. And her anti-aircraft battery was also improved throughout the war. In fact, she often has some of the densest anti-aircraft firepower of any of the German and German's cruiser force. However, okay, so. She's laid down in 1934. She's launched December 1934 and is commissioned in 1935. She specializes again in the Baltic while she's working up, and then she takes part in the cruises mentioned earlier in the Atlantic. She was made flagship of the reconnaissance forces of the German Navy. She participated in the non-intervention patrols, and by 1936, she was flying the flag of Comte Admiral Hermann Bohem. She's an important ship for the Germans when it comes to making their presence felt around the world. Especially in the European area, but also further afield. At the outbreak of World War II, she was assigned to the blockade force that was intended to prevent the Polish Navy from escaping the Baltic. Again, like her sister and all the other ships involved, they kind of failed. Then took part in the mine laying operations. And, well, yeah. When she was attacked, at the same time as sister was, by HMS Summon, um, she spotted the torpedoes heading towards her, and she turned hard to port to attempt to evade them. One managed to pass harmlessly ahead of the ship. The second struck her bow. Now, this is the point at which I say if the torpedo which had passed the front of Leipzig's bow had struck her, she would have probably ended up sinking because the damage done isn't that it isn't consistently that much compared to what the bow of the torpedo that hit Leipzig. But that, combined with the damage done to Leipzig, would probably be enough to cause Leipzig to go wonk. However, Nuremberg, and this just shows you're a peacetime navy, because the moment she's been struck in her bow, she reduces the speed to 12 knots to allow her crew to inspect the damage. Then... Surprisingly enough, after you've slowed down your cruiser, three more torpedo tracks are spotted to port. And so she has to accelerate to full speed and turn to starboard. The torpedoes all explode in the cruiser's wake. <sighs> they then tried to engage Salmon with um, her, their rearmost main battery turret, but had no effect. That well-known ASW weapon. Six-inch guns. I don't know. Interesting enough, it was only in June 1940 that her captain, Otto Kuba, who was the captain's of sea of Nuremberg, was told she wouldn't participate in Operation Juno, which was the sortie, of course, by Nisenau and Scharnhorst. And instead, she goes off to Norway and takes part in duties up there. She has a visit from Italian admirals. She spends her time working with destroyers and trying to escort various battleships around, including, of course, Nisenau herself, when Nisenau had been hit by a torpedo by another British submarine. 
I can imagine the British submarine commander going, I fire a spread and I only get one hit. The British are going, yeah, because you're all S class. Where are the T class boats? Fire 10. We'll guarantee two hits. <sighs> Nuremberg has an interesting career. She has an interesting life. She basically spends her entire time running around the battleships of the German Navy, trying to provide them with some protection. Trying to do mine laying operations, trying to support destroyers in operations, and she just ends up never being enough. There's only one of her. There aren't enough German light -like cruisers. You know, here's the thing. If you're going to go to war and you have capital ships, you can work out from your capital ships roughly your numbers of what ships you're going to need to escort them. If you're building battleships or aircraft carriers, you probably, realistically, need at least a heavy cruiser per capital ship or aircraft carrier. So that's your number you're supposed to be aiming for, at least. You probably need, probably, for them to be able to fulfill their other duties and provide task forces of sufficient strength for those ships to, to light cruisers for each of those capital ships and aircraft carriers. More if you expect to do more with them. I, if they're supposed to be doing mine laying operations and other duties and maybe some independent operations, you're going to need more of them. Same with the heavy cruisers. Destroyers. Well, if you're going to be escorting capital ships, etc., and those things around, you're going to need at least a flotilla per capital ship. Uh, plus, because they're going to take maintenance, and destroyers are light things which go at high speed most of the time for them, uh, you're probably going to need uh, about a flo an extra half flotilla of destroyers per ship. And then you're going to want the things that, to, them to, to them to do other duties as well. So roughly, you're going to be aiming for two to three to flotillas of destroyers per capital ship. I'm not kidding you. This is what you should be thinking about. This is what you have to think about when you're building a fleet. It's not just a case of going, I got battleships. Woohoo! But a battleship or an aircraft carrier is not a task group. It's not a, definitely not a task force. It's not even a combat a, a, a battle group or anything because it's just one ship. Two battleships. That's great, but that's still not a battle group. That is what you're sending out. But they have nothing to protect them from uh, do any submarine welfare work. They have nothing to access their scout. You know. If you're honestly building a decent combat group for the Germans and you're looking at it in World War II scenario and you're going, right, I want them to have a decent ability to deploy something into the Atlantic, which is going to seriously worry and disrupt the convoys. If you've got less than three Shan horse and an aircraft carrier, less than four heavy cruisers, less than eight light cruisers, and less than three to four flotillas of destroyers assigned to that group alone, plus supply ships, at any point it's going to have itself facing a lot of trouble because. It's kind of like every time the British and the Germans get ships out there. They send out a pair of cruisers, or a pair of battleships, or a single battleship and a single cruiser. Go out. What are the forces that are coming to face them? And I know, the British don't always get and make, it and make the right decisions, and sometimes they end up with scenarios like Bismarck, where Hood gets sunk. When the reality is, what you should have done is gone Hood link up with Victorious. King George V, Prince of Wales, go. And why would I say do that? Because what's the natural partnership? Battle cruiser and carrier or battle cruiser and battleship? Battle cruiser and carrier. They're both high speed. They both depend on their speed to keep their enemy at range so that their long-range weapons can damage them. It would have been far more sensible to have that as the option. But if you're the commander in chief, uh, commander of the forces, you want to keep your carrier with you to have the information. So 
perhaps you should swap flagships around. Anyway, the point is, if you go producing a one-dimensional force of naval power, you ultimately undermine your ability to project any sensible naval power. And the Germans were trapped into this. This is Nuremberg on her way to Britain, when eventually she'd be handed over to the Soviet Union, where she would become the Amr Vakrov, and is assigned to the 8th Fleet, based in Tallinn. A flagship of the 8th Fleet, in fact. After the Shapirev class entered service, the Makarov, as she was then known, was re removed from frontline duties and became a training cruiser at Konstad. We're not really sure what happened to her, but um, we think she was out of service by 1959 and was scrapped in 1960. She is the longest serving warship of the Kriegsmarine, major warship of the Kriegsmarine, and the only one to see active duties after the end of World War II, which is a testimony to her qualities as a ship, if not to quite the qualities of the design that actually produced the ship. Right, what have we got coming? Well, next week we have... Dun dun dun! The Duke and Scene class of the Marine Nationale! Woohoo! It's gonna be fun. Right. What else do I have to say? Well, thank you very much for people's um, super chats. Thank you to everyone. Well, that wouldn't have been on today because it's a long patrol, but when you do the super chats, thank you. Everyone. Thank you to everyone who's a patron and a subscriber to the channel. Thank you to everyone who watches the adverts, etc. All the money that's at the moment is currently going towards Canada! Yes, I'm looking forward to my trip to Canada. Um, everything's now booked in. Details will be being put out at some point. And the, once the details of the uh, various events are confirmed, they will be up as well. So, whoa, it's going to be fun. Thank you very much, everyone, for watching. Hope you enjoyed. And, uh, yeah, we're going to come up this week as well. We've got Titanic. It's coming up on the 14th. 110 years on, what lessons were learned? Not much. But remember, that's going to be slightly late this week as I'm coming back from basically north of North London to south of London. <laughs> so I'm coming around the M25. <laughs> That'll be fun. Take care, everyone, and uh, thank you.